Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. My name is Caverly Carey, and I am the program director for the Institute of East Asian Studies, under which we have the UC Berkeley Mongolia Initiative, which, together with the Center for Korea Studies, has brought you this afternoon's program today. And today, I hope we have what I think will be a pretty kinetic and thought-provoking afternoon of discussion of youth, music, politics, and identity in Korea and Mongolia. These two countries have strong historical connections, and in contemporary times, many people have crossed the borders between the two. But it is to the flow of music and youth culture that we turn today. You will see a great range. Some of the music and expression you will see this afternoon is hopeful and sunny, some of it very dark indeed, even disturbing. Um, we have four panelists who are going to be talking about Korea and four on Mongolia, and we plan to crisscross between the two and hope the dialectic will stimulate new and perhaps surprising comparisons. Because we have a very full program, I've asked our moderator, Brian Bauman, who teaches Mongolian language and history here, to forego introductions. Instead, we have printed bios for the speakers on the handouts uh, on the table here and another in the table in the back, so help yourself to those. We may have a brief opportunity for quick questions between panels as people change their technology, uh, but otherwise I'm going to ask you to hold your questions till the end when we can have a longer period for questions and for discussion. I'm going to open this pro afternoon's program with a trailer for a film called Mongolian Bling. It's a documentary about Mongolia's hip hop scene. Uh, Mongolia was, and to some extent still is, and certainly is in its imagination, a nomadic society, and thus song and the spoken word are, were held a special place in its traditional culture. We are likely to hear more about this intersection of traditional and contemporary in the panels to come. Uh, I launched the program with this clip because in its imagery it touches upon a number of themes our panelists may be picking up on, such as um, Mongolia's emergence from Soviet domination, its traditional culture and music in contrast to the teeming capital city's activities to which so many disenfranchised herders have fled, and youth who are juggling their participation in the global youth culture with their perceptions of their identities. If the audience, by the way, wishes to see the entire film, it is available on YouTube, and also we may be able to schedule a screening here at some point. If people are interested, they should see me after the, um, after the panel. Um, with that, I'm going to show you the film, and then I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, Brian Bauman. Mm. 
монголын өглөгшөөс нэг гадны хэрэг таадаад уурыгаад хол явахгүй гэж хэлнэ би. Монгол байгаар монгол юугээр хөмүүлж байна. Монголын үндэсний өвчин бол монголчууд хэм бэ гэдэг л хэлж байна. Okay, so that's so just some imagery to start us off with and with that I'm going to turn it over to our moderator Brian Bauman. Hi, uh, my name is, is Brian Bauman, as Carly, uh, Carly said. Um, uh, to quote a, a country western uh, reference, we've got a long way to go and a short time to get there. So um, um, with no ado at all, um, uh, our first speaker will be uh, uh, Yoon Young Jung uh, and, and her uh, paper, Producing K-pop, Negotiating National Identity identities, anxieties, and desires for the global cultural industry. Let's welcome her. Thank you, Kevin Lee, for putting this wonderful event together. And um, for the short time, I will just write, um, get right into it. Can you all hear me OK? Korea has a dynamic history of political and politicized music culture, as the nation itself has gone through turbulent internal and external political struggles, particularly since the Japanese coloni colonial period. For more than half a century, the Korean government has put great effort into re-establishing re its national pride and promoting Koreans' strong nationalism in the post-colonial nation state building process. Clearly recognizing the transformative power of music as a political tool, the Korean government has been cultivating various kinds of cultural policies on music to shape new Korean identities by encouraging nationalist, anti-communist, pro-military, and at times anti-Japanese attitude through censorship and propaganda. As the nation's focus was on political stability and economic development from the 1950s to the 1980s, cultural policymakers' interests were focusing on promoting proper Korean ethics and morals. By implementing multiple censorships and prohibitions on pop music, the Korean government tried to protect the public from unhealthy foreign influences. Since Korean pop music had been deeply rooted in both American and Japanese pop music from its beginning, most aspects of the censorships and prohibitions were established against direct and indirect influences from America and Japan. Policymakers were easily able to rationalize that such regulations were crucial to avoid cultural invasion by foreign forces. As Korea was severely traumatized by the Japanese colonization and was still dealing with the direct American military presence, the Korean, pub Korean public, especially the older generations, was largely in agreement with the nation's protectionist stance on pop culture. By the early 1990s, Korea was transformed into an industrial powerhouse and was able to establish the first civilian government. During these prosperous years, the Korean youth became important cultural consumers whose buying power started to influence the pop culture industry practices and musical styles. Dramatically different from the older generation in values, customs, lifestyles, and mindset, this new generation had little interest in the nation state building project, but desired more exciting cultural entertainment following global trends. In 1997, due to the Asian financial crisis, Korea was once again traumatized as its economy almost collapsed. In order to save the nation's economy, the Koreans' shared national purpose and willingness to sacrifice were emphasized again by the Korean government. During the crisis, Korea went through radical economic reforms that led to extensive modifications on foreign and cultural policies, including more flexible rules on cultural censorships. 
Also, the Korean government started to provide financial support for the cultural industry to extend, expand outside Korea as the Korean wave took off. One of the most notable policy changes was the ending of the official ban on importing Japanese cultural products that had been in place from the 1960s. Due to the strongly lingering anti-Japanese sentiment and the fear of cultural invasion by the more advanced Japanese pop culture industry, Korea's open door policy towards Japanese pop culture went through multiple stages of negotiating and renegotiating processes between 1998 and 2004. It is important to note that specifics of the Korean wave in different countries vary, as their political, economic, and cultural relations with Korea are different. Still, the case of Japan stands out as the two countries' political and economic power relations have historically been strained. Thus, Korea viewed the success of the Korean wave in Japan, despite its late arrival there in 2003, as particularly victorious and beneficial for elevating Korean national pride. Also, the immediate backlash against the Korean wave in Japan was seen as a sign of Japan's anxiety as Korean pop culture became more popular than Japanese pop culture in many parts of Asia, where things had been the other way around. Ironically, through an extensive repackaging and Japanizing process, the Korean pop music consumed in Japan between 2003 and 2005 was rarely Korean in styles or lyrics, but basically Japanese performed by Koreans. The K-pop boom in Japan between 2010 and 2012 still followed this practice. While Korea was celebrating the K-pop boom as Korea's second national victory against Japan, backlash was rapidly growing in Japan. Ignited by the former Korean President Lee's visit to the Dokdo Takeshima Islands in 2012, the K-pop boom in Japan suddenly declined. Since Japan had been the most profitable market, the K-pop industry could not simply abandon the Japanese market, but constantly had to gauge their promotional approaches as political, political winds shifted. Success in the US pop market has been the K-pop industry's ultimate goal. Several attempts were made between 2008 and 2012, but results were far from successful. Then size Gangnam Style surprised everyone. After the size, su size success, the K-pop industry quickly began to utilize the social media, YouTube in particular, as a key marketing tool and became very successful. At the same time, numerous government agencies and programs, provincial and city councils, research centers and grants, and many more have been established to support the expansion of K-pop worldwide. Since it is f practically the first time in history that Korea has been the center of global attention, that it is not only positive, but also very profitable, Korea as a whole has been supportive on this new national building project. For many decades, Korea viewed culture as tradition to preserve and protect, and pop music was considered as unhealthy and problematic for building a strong national identity. But nowadays, K-pop has become Korea's shining star commodity, with K-pop stars representing various governmental agencies as honorable, honorary ambassadors, improving Korea's national image worldwide. What sells and comes from Korea is Korean, both at home and across much of the world. Like this example by one of the most successful K-pop bands, Big Bangs, um, Fantastic Baby. I will just play a little bit of the music video. Fantastic baby. Dance. I wanna 
Thank you for that. Uh, next up, we'll have um, from Cal State East Bay, uh, Peter Marsh. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it, uh, it's my honor to be the, um, the lead batter with the, for the Mongolia team here uh, for today. We're going to go back and forth. We should be wearing like caps with M's and K's on that so you can keep clear as who we are. I'm going to talk to you about today about M-pop, but starting with K-pop. K-pop has its origins, of course, back in about 25 years ago or so, and uh, very quickly became a musical and cultural phenomena, right? Uh, hundreds of artists, millions of fans, as, as Yu Young told us here in her, her slides here, hundreds of millions, I guess hundreds of millions of dollars in profit and a global reach that especially with Psy and Gangnam Style is the envy of pop musicians around the world. In contrast, M-pop, or Mongolian pop in Mongolia, is uh, a little bit more than eight years old and um, is centered around just one guy. Uh, uh, the, He's, he's known as Day Bolt, or Bolt is just Bolt in general here, one of Mongolia's most successful pop singers. In 2010, Bolt announced with great fanfare what he called the start of the Mongol pop project. He says in his interviews here, I've been trying to combine the old traditional instruments of my country to modern pop music, thereby making a new style that retains the beauty of the old traditions. We can see this in the trend that represents Mongolian pop. He goes on to say that his passion, it's his passion that our Mongolian music style of music would touch the hearts not only of Mongolians, but those around the world. For Bolt, creating Mongol pop was a way to honor his Mongolian culture and reach a broader audience with a unique product. And he points out his inspiration to do this by the work of the pop music he sees in Japan and Korea. Indeed, if the goal is to commodify and propagate an idealized form of national or cultural identity, what better model to imitate than the K-pop model? I'm curious about M-pop and it's how it compares to K-pop and really what is, what is new about M-pop. To date, Bolt's efforts are expressed in two CD albums, M-pop and M-pop 2. Each contain numerous images along with the CDs and a number of songs have been made into music videos. In terms of visuals, um, I think you might be able to see some similarities to K-pop. For one thing, the attention to dress and to style, this easy mixing of the global and the national. It's very cosmopolitan, this scene we see up, we see up here. Notice how the national element there, I'm looking in particular at uh, Bolt in his suit and tie sitting next to a woman in her traditional dress. Notice how this symbolic national is not shunted off to the kitchen, uh, creating tea for everybody else here. She's right there in the mix, right with everybody else, as if suggesting that you know, being a hip and modern Mongol today means embracing both the global and the national, the present and the past or if not embracing, maybe at least schmoozing with the, with the past, right? And as we've been warned, such smoothing can lead to the conception of new cultural forms, such as the clothing line that Bolt likes to show off whenever he gets the opportunity, fusing the global and the national. What we see here is him wearing kind of a, it's a, it's a modern dress based upon an old traditional dress, the old traditional dales uh, that he likes to show off. But what about impop in performance? Bolt in pop tends to be more explicitly national and cultural than the K-pop I've heard. We see this in one of his, his most popular hits from his first album um, called Herin Sachte Aizgo, The Melody of the Wild Wind. This is a song dedicated to the horsehead fiddle, which you can see him holding there, a two-string bowed folk fiddle that has great symbolic importance for the Mongolians. It's believed that Chinggis Khan, it was Chinggis Khan's favorite instrument. 
And indeed, this video begins with Bolt playing the role of a battle-hardened 13th century Mongol general seemingly stopped in his tracks by the sound of the fiddle played by the Chinggis Khan character. It seems to stir his soul and some, touch something deep in, uh, in his, his something deep in his soul, some deep element in his, his identity. Any uh, similarities to K-pop in all of this here? Um, you know, the, the upbeat tempos, the dance rhythms, the choreographed movements, the impossibly beautiful young people in this here, the highly produced, seamless quality of the production here. Everything is very, very accessible. Um, and this focus on the style, focus on dress, and this easy mixing of the national and the global. The focus is on love, but of course it's love for a symbolic national instrument here and the, the cultural heritage that surrounds it. It is this hybridity of the, the global and the national, the old and the new, that's this new trend that Bolt is talking about, something he says he introduced to pop music, but it's hardly new to Mongolian pop, actually. Go back to the 1960s, to the first official Mongolian pop group in the early, actually, the, not the 60s, the early 70s. The group is called Soil Erne. It's called Cultural Jewel. And we see in what they're trying to do also an attempt to mix the so-called folk traditions with the modern idiom, the idiom of modern pop music. I just want to give you a taste of what this sounds like. Not as flashy as Bolt's productions, right? 
But do we trying to do a similar thing here, trying to bring together the folk and the modern in this way? In addition, the, the group Soil Edna was managed by the Communist Party. Um, the party officials saw all aspects of the performance. They supplied the instruments. They determined the performing venues for these performers. They had professional composers and lyricists compose the music and write the lyrics. The party selected the performer's clothing. They even determined what their hairstyle should look like. Doesn't this sound like some of the, the K-pop groups, the kind of management that they have to endure. And this is back in the 1970s, hardly a new trend. The party management, the party's management of popular music continued until the early 1990s, at which time Mongolia achieved political and economic independence from the Soviet Union. During the Socialist Party, Mongolian party officials pushed this global, national, modern folk mix as part of a political ideology that sought to represent Mongolian culture as rising up, as developing, as joining the international community as an equal. Look, Mongolians are doing pop music now, kind of thing here. With the collapse of party, the party rule in 1990, Mongolia's pop artists abandoned this political ideology like a hot potato, instead turning to imitate the sound sounds and styles of global pop artists, particularly those from the US and uh, Britain. Bolt himself achieved fame in his group in his late teens in the group um, called Camerton from the early 19, uh, late 1990s. This group is closely aligned with the music, lyrics, and look of the American boy band Boys to Men. In other words, they adopted an explicitly Western style, a style in which the national or the traditional was kept out of sight, hidden way back in the kitchen. Indeed, what is stylistically new or remarkable about what Bolt's M-pop is doing is not the use of folk-infused musical style, but rather its return to pop culture. The last time this style dominated pop culture was in the socialist period, a period in which all art was political and had serious political consequences. That Bolt's Impop project was praised by the Mongolian president uh, a number of years ago, and a few years ago he received the, uh, a major award dedicated just to artists, a, a major state award given to artists, suggests that his stylistic message of, of his music, that um, one of national unity and progress rooted in a shared ancestry closely aligns with the political or cultural ideology of the current government. This message of unity and progress that we find in all of his music here comes in a period of increasing disunity and fracture within Mongolian society. Long simmering social tensions, exasperated by pressures coming from the global economy, climate change, endemic corruption, are shifting and unsettling long-standing conceptions of Mongolian identity. Pop culture can be a place where people turn to, turn to go away, go away from these frustrations and these fears caused by these kinds of pressures, it can also be a place where frustrations and fears are often poignantly and point, pointedly expressed. My colleagues today, my teammates, I could say here, will be exploring these alternative visions of pop music in their presentations. So thank you for your attention. Uh, next up, from the University of Kentucky, we'll have Donna Kwan uh, talking uh, about performative hybridity, nationalism, and the cultivation of participatory youth culture in Korean hip hop. Let's welcome her. Hello, everyone. It's, it's great to be back at Berkeley. Um, graduated from here, so it's always nice to be back here. Um, Okay, so um, in this short presentation, I would like to explore how cultural continuity and hybridity has been actualized in performance through collaborations with Korean folk performers, um, as well as through the cultivation of uniquely Korean modes of participation in live hip hop performances. Um, but first of all, I just want to um, kind of reiterate what Dr. Jung was saying and just sort of question this idea that there's this sort of new nationalism going on in, um, in K-pop and also in hip-hop because it's, it's sort of this nationalist trend is something that I've noticed pretty much from its inception um, and there's a lot of reasons that Dr. Jung um, laid out for um, there being sort of strong nationalist tendencies in Korean popular music. Um, my second point is that um, 
In general, I feel like it's more productive to think about nationalism trends less as an either or move towards or away from Korean nationalist musical tendencies and more as a drive to promote a global Korea through K-pop or more specifically in hip hop. Here I'm influenced by Ian Condry, who asserts that Japanese hip hop is an expression of a global Japan where, quote, neither global homogenization nor localization accurately captures the ways the musical style has changed, unquote. Or in other words, we can interpret nationalism operating in youth culture oriented um, music in multiple ways, not just from the presence of overtly national, uh, nationalist or patriotic um, lyrics or from the dominant presence of Korean lyrical or musical content or instruments um, or other cultural signifiers. Um, with this said, I would like to take the remaining time to look at how cultural continuity and hybridity has been actualized in live performance in Korean hip hop to express a, um, a kind of Korean hip hop nation that is both um, global and local. And here is sort of echoes of what Dr. Marsh was saying as well, this combination of the global and the national or the global and the local. Um, one way that cultural continuity has occurred um, in live performance is through the collaboration with Korean folk performers. Um, perhaps one of the splashiest collaborations between Korean rhythmic traditions, um, Korean samonori and, and pungmo, and hip hop, hip hop sensibilities was initiated by the samonori master himself, Kim Dok Su. And um, fortunately, this video doesn't work, but I'll just describe it. Um, in, 2000, in a 2007 performance at the Jeonju Sori um, Chukjera Festival, I saw a performance of Kim Dok Su's team, Han Hanu Lim, collaborate with some of Jeonju's b boy dance teams. Um, not only were the rhythms of the Samonori style selected by Kim Dok Su to coordinate with these hip hop beats and the b boy dancers, but the movements of the standing style of Samonori with the acrobatic turns and the Sangmo, the streamer that um, go around that are attached to the players' um, heads um, also echoed the movements, the circular movements of the b-boys, um, creating this really spectacular kind of synergy um, or of kinesthesia and space. Um, because of its visual and sonic appeal, this is one of the most tangible examples of how Koreans have created sort of a um, synchronicity um, of Korean folk traditions with b-boy dancing to create a truly sort of global, um, global and local comprehensive um, artistic expression. Um, in live hip hop performances at clubs in South Korea, um, I noticed the prevalence of kind of a participatory sensibility um, that in many ways I found to be kind of reminiscent of what, I've, what I experienced in my research um, on Korean folk traditions, um, namely um, uh, Korean pungmul rural drumming practices. For example, some common participatory activities in pungmul are the emphasis on embodied participations where you have all the dancers or kind of swaying and moving with the drummers, um, synchronized movement and dancing, the calling of shouts um, called chwimse. Um, sometimes you have call and response going on, like, oishigo, chalshigo, chiwaja, chota, this kind of thing going back and forth. Um, and also, sometimes in more longer songs that you might hear in Pungmul, there's just sort of the repeated refrains that, if you know the tradition well, um, everybody in the audience would know um, and sing along. Um, in, in the show that I'm going to focus on here, uh, it's a, it was a Melon Impact show at Club Holic in Gangnam, um, featuring YDG, um, Booga Kings, MC Sniper, um, Tog E, LEO, or Leo Kakoa, um, 45 RPM, DG, Fresh Boys, 4 Minute, and others. And I found examples of this sort of participatory sensibility pretty much throughout the whole performance. So I'm going to sort of detail some of these. Um, that I found to be kind of similar to what I experienced in Korean folk performances. Um, so the first one is the pre prevalence of repeated refrains. Um, so the one of the groups called Bling the Cash, <laughs> um, they had a song where they would have everybody sing along, that sway, that sway, that sway, 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 that kind of thing. And they'd had everybody repeat pretty much the same phrase. Um, there was a beatboxer named Beatbox um, Effect. 
and um, which is part of, he's a part of a group called Dope Who's, or at least he was at the time, where you would have everybody sing 4 a.m., 4, 4, 4 a.m., and everybody would repeat 4 a.m., 4, 4, 4 a.m. Um, and sometimes the participatory sort of feeling of these hip hop performances would, um, uh, would they would sometimes draw on other songs, um, well-known songs, um, either just you know well-known songs that are out there or well-known hip hop or funk recordings, if it, even if it means that they're not necessarily playing their own original material. So one example is um, the group Booga Kings. Um, they rapped over George Clinton's Atomic Dog, um, and then they layered um, uh, you know clap your hands everybody, come on guys and girls clap your hands or Son Byukcho Dagachi, both in English and in Korean, um, and then they would have everybody singing along Atomic. Dog, <laughs> bow wow wow, yippee yo, yippee <laughs> bow wow, yippee yo, yippee So that everybody doing that, even though it wasn't necessarily a Korean song, but they just it was a way for them to get everybody kind of um, participating and into it. Um, another interesting example I found from the same show was um, DG. Um, kind of midway through his set, he had everybody sing along the anthem. Um, I'm not sure where this came from, but uh, he had everybody sing uh, hip hop, hip hop, hip hop to the so to the tune of Battle Hymn of the Republic. So they had hip hop, 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 hip hop. Hip hop, hip hop, hip hop, hip hop, hip hop, Bessalia, or long live hip hop, something like that. So they had everybody singing that and singing along and doing it like as a refrain as well. Um, Another thing that I noticed was there is a really high prevalence of call and response. Pretty much every single group you know, incorporated some type of call and response. Um, the first group, there was one female group, Four Minute. Um, they kind of taught this sort of call and response thing in the beginning, where they actually taught the audience what to do. Um, MC Sniper, I'll play a clip of this later, he begins his whole set with a really extended call and response um, section. Um, Burger Kings, they have a song called Tic Tac Toe, and they'd have people repeat the tic tac toe part. Um, Leah Coco would say, um, you know, his name is Leo. He would say, when I say Ellie, you say O, Ellie, O, Ellie, O. So we'd have people calling his name back and forth. Um, an another group, RPM, 45 RPM, they have this really catchy song called Julgo and Sengwai, or um, Happy Life. And um, they have the sort of refrain chorus where um, one line it goes, MC Tara. Rhythm and macho, hip hop or wecho, and everybody else says hip hop kind of thing. And so there's there's four lines to it, but at the second and fourth line, there's these sort of responses that um, the audience knows and will and will do. Um, YDG, um, really uh, well known actor as well. Um, he had a repeated call and response with his hit um, Kolmokil, so which means like alleyway, I guess. And he would say Kolmokil. Everybody else would go Kolmokil, Kolmokil, Kolmokil. So there's just a ton of call and response throughout. Um, Another thing I noticed was the um, encouragement of synchronized movement. So, you know, you have a, sort of that typical hip hop sort of swaying of hands happening, but you see that a lot in Korean folk performance as well. It's just a slightly different kind of movement. You know, it, you know in hip hop, it's more like this. Um, and then there was one guy, the beatboxer, um, beatbox effect, where he actually instructed people to move in a certain way. I um, mean, he would, he would say, okay, there's gonna be a point in the performance where I'm gonna tell you to like yell, like sorijilla, and jump, and yell like crazy. You can even curse if you want to. And then there's like a section where it kind of goes like, you know, where everybody, he just wants everybody to jump like this, like all together in, syn in, in a synchronized matter, manner. Um, Another way that I, another thing that I thought was interesting is that they kind of um, create this sort of heightened sensory um, experience and uh, about three quarters of the way or towards the end of the performance, they actually sprayed water on everybody. And it's kind of a wholesome, it's youth culture in Korea, so it's kind of a wholesome kind of scene compared to maybe a hip hop show in the US. So there's not a ton of, you know, drugs or, you know, tons of alcohol binging and that kind of thing. So, you know, they do stuff like spray water on everyone to kind of create um, a more heightened sensory sort of feeling. Um, 
Another thing that I think could potentially be sort of participatory is the use of cell phones. So a lot of people took out their cell phones during heightened moments. And um, I, I think this is sort of participatory because it taps into this desire to share the experience with other people You know, when they get home and post it somewhere. Um, and it's also resonant with what I've seen at a lot of Korean folk festivals too, just tons of people taking video and you have to kind of scramble to find a good place to do it. Okay, so lastly, I want to take note of the multiple languages at play, most commonly Korean and English, but there are also various musical and textual clips of Korean and American songs and genres that are faceted into the performances. With beatbox effect, um, I was especially struck by how he single handedly embodies all of these elements. Um, depending on the context and audience, artists such as Beatbox Effect may choose to highlight certain languages, songs, or genres to perform Korea's relationship to the rest of the world in various ways. So for example, um, just as Sai's Gangnam style was beginning to crest in international popularity in the fall of 2012, Beatbox Effect definitely weaves in its dubstep influence groove and call and response, and then proceeds to match this up with two anyone's huge hit, you know, I am the best or nega chel talaga, where, and here the I um, can be interpreted as Korea, Korea um, as he pays homage to this unexpected high point in um, K-pop. So I'll play a clip of this. I just want a real inequality. <laughs> I want to close by coming back to the notion of nationalism in Korean hip hop. One theme I've noticed in underground Korean hip hop is the um, this idea of coming together as one, as one nation in hip hop. Um, in the late 1990s and early 2000s, rappers like um, Da Crew and Leo advocated for a pan Asian hip hop nation, um, and you can kind of see this in the lyrics to this song here. Um, uh, wh where the lyrics are from Seoul to Hong Kong, from Hong Kong to Taiwan, east, west, south, north, no matter where you are, we're all one in hip hop, we're all one. Um, however, in this Club Holic concert, I'm not sure the Pan Asian sentiment was as strong, especially for MC Sniper, who called for, quote, one nation, one people. Um, and maybe I'll play a clip of this. Um, he also released a collaborative album uh, with the same name, One Nation. Um, perhaps it is DG who strikes the most complex stance on hip hop and national nationalism in his parodic um, participatory performance of hip hop, hip hop, hip hop, hip hop to the tune of um, Battle Hymn um, Battle Him of the Republic. Um, in a way, I feel like he is drawing the audience into kind of this nationalist sentiment about the hip hop nation, but is also kind of making fun of it, I think, at the same time. So. Yeah. Okay, so I'll end there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next up, we'll have um, uh, from Loyola Marymount University, Charlotte de Evelyn, uh, speaking on reinforcing and transcending borders, pop music and nationalism in Inner Mongolia, China. So 
since I submitted the title, I changed it just a bit. Um, I'm hoping to explore the, the first title at some point. Um, but one of the things that I discovered as I was pursuing this project um, was the question of what is nationalism in Inner Mongolia and what does it sound like? Um, what does it look like? And part of this process actually involved um, searching for nationalism and searching for the ways that that might be um, sort of manifested through pop music in Inner Mongolia. So I'll first give you um, a quick overview of what I would say are the flavors of pop music that you might find in Inner Mongolia. Um, so the first would be um, the broader genre of Mandarin language pop songs, often uh, categorized under this broader category of minority pop. In Inner Mongolia, this is specifically grassland songs that um, oftentimes romanticize uh, the grassland through Mandarin language lyrics, the representative artist being Tungur. Um, this is Cao Yan Ge Chu in Chinese. Um, secondly, being f um, maybe some of you are already familiar with Hangai, uh, there are globally they are globally very well recognized. Um, there are lots of groups like this um, using basically um, a combination of rock styles with Mongolian instruments and also homi throat singing. Um, and then as I was digging deeper, I actually have not done field work on the underground pop music scene in Inner Mongolia. I discovered that there is a very live and well um, underground hip hop scene. There's also a rock scene um, in Huhut and uh, some other big cities. And actually the video that I discovered through the beautiful nature of YouTube and online research is that um, I, I found an, um, actually a very good video example that I'll be using as the sort of centerpiece for my talk today, very short talk. And then of course, um, I would be amiss to, to mention that most of my friends in Inner Mongolia love pop music from Mongolia, the country. That, um, that is probably the most, um, the largest quantity of the music that they listen to is music, um, pop music, hip hop, et cetera, from um, Ulaanbaatar. Um, so just a very quick overview of Hangai. Um, who I've seen live in Beijing. They um, often perform in venues for foreigners. Um, they also perform at the Beijing MIDI Festival. And even when you look at their look, there's something to be said about their nationalism, um, their ethnic nationalism, that they, um, they are very proud to be Mongol. They are very proud to not be Chinese, and they sometimes sort of emphasize that through their dress. Um, and um, and through their instruments. However, if you looked at their lyrics, most of their songs are just folk, basically folk songs rearranged with a rock beat. Um, and so lyrically, their songs do not express that kind of ethnic nationalism that you might um, um, be looking for if you're looking for where's the nationalism in, in Inner Mongolian or Mongolian pop music in China. Um, Tungar is another um, example that I felt like I had to um, bring up in this presentation. He is, um, he's one of the only pop s singers, as far as I know, that actually broke out into Mongolia. Um, I think his song Mon Mongol, which was um, he sang in both M Mongol, Mongolian and in Mandarin, um, was popular in Mongolia, which is no small feat. Um, his lyrics for this song are fairly nostalgic talking about the um, smoke of the cooking from the f cooking fire from the gare. Um, I was born in a family of hurting people. The vast grassland is the cradle that nurtures us. Um, so the song uh, tends to be more um, thinking about the past and thinking about how Mongolians used to live, um, references to uh, Mongolian lifestyles. Um, there is important work on Tungur, if you're interested. Um, Nimrod Baranovich has written extensively about um, Tungur and how he's both kind of conforming to the state model for what a grassland song should be, but he also resists that a little bit and inserts his own um, idea of ethnic nationalism in there. Okay, so as I was doing this re um, research for this project, I came upon this wonderful video that kind of was everything I wanted it to be. It was um, the sentiment that I heard from so many of my friends and contacts in Inner Mongolia um, were, all, were very much expressed in these lyrics. And thank you, a shout out to Tamir Hargana for helping me with the translation here. Um, so Onso Cross, who I've never met and I actually haven't um, 
contacted with them yet, and I'm looking forward to doing so this summer, hopefully. Um, they're an underground hip hop group based in Huhut. And um, what I wanna sort of do through showing this video is to, um, to give a little bit of a sense of what Mongols in an Inner Mongolia face in terms of their ethnic identity and the opportunities for nationalism, which um, ultimately have to be ethnic and not related to nationalism associated with a nation state because they live in China. Um, but I think actually going through the lyrics as I've done, I'll, I'll be going through sort of these line by line um, just to, to piece this apart. Um, almost gives you a, a very good sense of the, the sentiments and the history of Inner Mongolia. So we'll just start with the video itself and then I'll just go through the lyrics very quickly in the end. Mongol so I'm gonna move it forward so we can get to the end here. So I'll get to each of these things um, one by one here. So the um, the lyrics go the Hulk call us Hujia, which I guess is a demeaning term for the Chinese in Mongolia. Um, but there are other real Mongols that the world knows. It is known in history where are over Mongols. Um, people are over Mongol Chud, which is the Inner Mongolians. We should stop dividing between South and North. Um, please see that there are not many Mongols in over Mongol. Because of the losses of 1947 and 1949, we are living in the mistakes of history, same as Manchuria. History is upending us, but Huhud is still the same Huhud of the old Mongols. Whatever you do, wherever you go, you are over Mongol. This is your homeland. Okay, um, so first, um, our, um, our over Mongol should, we should stop dividing between North and South. So I'll go into this first. Um, so this term that they're using um, actually um, probably translates better as Southern Mongolia than it does Inner Mongolia. Um, the over actually means the bosom or the, the front side of a mountain. Um, and over Mongol Chud is the term that's now used for Inner Mongolian, as opposed to maybe Ar Mongol, but usually Mongol just means Mongols who live in Mongolia, whereas for the Inner Mongols, they have to use that over in order to distinguish themselves. Um, they would be excluded oftentimes from that uh, ability to call themselves Mongol Chud, um, at least according to the Halk people. Um, but of course, we know that. Um, and those of us who work in this region know that these cultures straddle the boundaries. Um, I like this map that Carol Pig has in her book that shows just how much these musical styles, um, of course, languages, language dialects, um, and other things are also crossing these borders. So the borders are somewhat arbitrary, although they're based kind of on the, the Gobi Desert, north and south of the Gobi. Um, so going into the losses of 1947 and 1949, um, so they're referring to the, the 
legacy, basically, of the establishment of the Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region in 1947, um, based on the decisions of a few Mongolian cadres, basically, who agreed with the CCP that they would join the um, People's Republic of China, which happened in 1949. And of course, this legacy of um, North and South Mongolia is um, from the Qing Dynasty when these two th um, regions were separated. And the inner part of Mongolia was more closely administered by the Qing Dynasty. Um, so this idea that the Halkh, um, and this is the majority ethnic group in Mongolia, um, basically are demeaning to the Mongols. This is something that's been written about kind of extensively. Actually, Frank Boulet, who's here, has talked about um, the sort of fear about the Chinese takeover of Mongolia and the um, lingering sentiments of um, sort of displeasure about what happened during the Qing dynasty. Um, Radin Bulag has also talked um, about this difficulty that the Inner Mongols face as basically not being able to be welcomed into the ethnic group and oftentimes called being called Chinese. Um, this, I think, sort of sums it up very well. Um, Urleg Burjagud, who is a scholar, writes that many Inner Mongolians imagined um, when they were living in, in China that they had this transnational community of Mongols. but found when going to Ulaanbaatar upon recontact in the 1980s that these Mongolians in Mongolia treated them with disdain and considered them assimilated by the Han. And this is a sentiment that I experience quite a bit um, from my Mongolian friends in Inner Mongolia. Um, this other sentiment, please see that there are not many Mongols in Uvar Mongol. Actually, they are, they're dwarfed by the population of Han, um, most prominently seen in Huhad itself, the capital. Um, in which they're only 9% of the population and struggling to keep their traditions alive um, in the midst of urbanization and Chinese um, influences. Uh, this can also be seen in this, this genre of Mandarin language grassland songs, which is how a lot of Mongolians make a living if they want to be a musician, is to cater to Han Chinese tourists. Uh, this is, I'm not going to play the video, but you can get a little sense of the lyrics of some of these songs. They're sung in Mandarin Chinese um, by Mongolians um, and basically selling themselves and selling a particularly or orthodox version of Mongolianness to the Chinese who want to see the Mongolians as a romantic kind of backwards people. Um, so it's interesting. Um, it seems like throughout the song they're talking, about, talking to the Halkh. It almost seems like a message to the Hulk, hey, listen to us, we are legitimate. But then at the end, they actually um, sort of switch around and they're talking to the Over Mongols and then they say, hey, don't forget your inner Mongolian, this is your homeland, which I think is an interesting um, move because they then at the end of the song um, display this national symbol of the nation of Mongolia, which is very much a part of um, the national identity of Mongolia, the Soyombo. Um, which I found very interesting. So I'll just sum up here. There's a lot more analysis that I need to do and I'm looking forward to meeting them. Um, but this piece over Mongol Trud by the artist, artists on So Cross demonstrates a unique sort of nationalism that exists in Inner Mongolia, one that is ethnically rather than nation state based and one that is also perpetually qualified by this modifier over. Um, they, they're not allowed to call themselves <laughs> Mongol Chud. They oftentimes feel obligated to call themselves over Mongol Chud also as a meaningful marker to separate themselves historically and to mark their contemporary experiences of marginalization. At the same time that they emphasize their identity as Southern Mongols, they demonstrate a longing to identify with the nation of Mongolia to the extent that they even have it on their body, that, um, that national symbol. Um, a statement like this would probably make the song impossible to pass Chinese censorship, thus making them um, stay in the underground. These sentiments of inner Mongol solidarity alongside a desire to achieve legitimacy in the eyes of Hulk Mongols resonates with my experiences speaking with Mongols and hear about their desire to be accepted as real Mongols. The medium of hip hop and its attention to uncovering political injustices um, together with the underground nature of this particular group's activity seems to enable these musicians to express this widely held longing for legitimacy. And I look forward to following up with this group when I go to Inner Mongolia this summer. Thank you. Next up, we'll have uh, Stephanie Choi from UC Santa Barbara, and she'll speak to us on, on Jay Park, from nationalist K-pop to transnational K-hip-hop. Let's welcome her. Well, 
while many conceive of K-pop as a native product, the K-pop industry has consistently recruited Korean American and Asian American adolescents under the belief that they have American musical talent uh, in the appearance of Korean race. And what I mean by American is um, they they uh, prioritize the um, Western modernity that that is. Uh, reflected in their American manners, such as uh, bodily gestures or fluent um, American English accent, um, which is embodied in the, the Korean looking appearance. Um, so once they recruit these Asian American or Korean American adolescents, they go through the Korean style uh, training system where they teach how to bow, how to respect elders, how to look uh, humble to their fans. And then eventually, as uh, Dr. Zhang said, uh, they become the cultural ambassador of uh, South Korea. And this draws a contrast between how Korean Americans are viewed differently in, uh, in the American and uh, Korean mainstream media, uh, and also in academic scholarship. Uh, in United States, Asian Americans have experienced discrimination and assimilation processes as uh, institutional, at institutional and cultural levels, um, as they were once barred from becoming US citizens, owning property and marrying white population, and experienced uh, discriminatory housing policies, unfair labor practices, violent uh, physical encounters, and anti-immigrant discourse. Uh, meanwhile, Korean American masculinity in particular uh, is often deemed threatening to the Korean public. Um, so the widespread belief is that these Korean Americans do not fulfill legal and cultural citizenship obligations, such as uh, national loyalty and tax payments, uh, which is not true, but that's the, uh, that's, that's the public sentiment in, in Korea. Uh, military conscription is uh, definitely one of the most sensitive issue in Korea. Uh, all men should go uh, go to army and uh, serve in the military for at least two years uh, when they're in their 20s. Um, and a lot of, not a lot, but it has been a constant social issue uh, when some of these uh, Korean males try to avoid uh, serving in the military by uh, um, uh, through through uh, bribe or sometimes they even um, cut their fingers to you know uh, purposely becoming disabled uh, person to avoid this uh, military service. Um, dual citizenship uh, dual citizens can avoid fulfilling military duty by choosing the U.S. citizenship, and um, there was a great controversy uh, when. Stephen Yu, who was one of the most popular singer uh, in the 90s, uh, had a dual citizenship. And then he was keep telling his fans and the public that uh, he will uh, serve uh, in the military. But then later on, people found out that he, uh, he abandoned the Korean citizenship and acquired a US citizenship in order to avoid uh, military service. So eventually he, uh, he was deported uh, permanently by the Korean government. So today I want to talk about Jay Park, who is uh, the third generation Korean American singer who debuted in Korea as a K-pop idol, but then uh, later he lost his job as an idol singer um, for, for um, For this, um, for his, uh, for for commenting uh, anti-nationalist uh, uh, comment on his webpage, but then later on he returned uh, within five months as a hip hop uh, artist. So Jay Park is a third generation Korean American, um, so he can only go to. Uh, Korean army by becoming a Korean citizen via naturalization, but he's not obliged to choose uh, either American or Korean citizenship. Um, 
uh, he was casted by one of the biggest idol companies uh, called JYP Entertainment and debuted as a member of idol group 2PM in 2008. A year later, uh, in 2009, fans found out his comments on his old MySpace webpage saying, uh, Korea is gay, I hate Koreans, I want to go back home. Um, JYP and J Park apologized officially, but eventually in February 2010, uh, JYP released a statement that J will leave the group. So there was a controversy among the public and uh, among the fans, and eventually he was uh, he had to leave the band. But in July 2010, uh, just within five months, he returned to Korea as a hip hop artist. He contracted, uh, a, uh, signed a contract with Sidus HQ, which is a famous actor company. Um, and then uh, later on in 2013, he established his own hip hop label uh, called AOMG, and he's been maintaining a successful career. Um, as a hip hop artist, um, and he signed a contract with Rock Nation, Jay Z's Rock Nation, uh, last year. So my question is: If Jay left 2 p.m. because of Korean nationalism, it would have been impossible for him to come back to the Korean entertainment industry. But what made it possible for him to come back within uh, five months? And I argue that the difference. Uh, in fan cultures and K-pop, uh, which is also called as uh, idol music in Korea, and Korean hip-hop. Um, the difference in fan cultures in K-pop and Korean hip-hop shows how Jay is perceived and treated uh, differently uh, to each fandom. So K-pop is a fan-dominant culture where idols are perceived as service workers who provide pleasure and intimacy to their fans. Uh, idols are obliged to be polite and humble, especially to their fans, and respect, uh, respect them and serve, uh, provide service, which is, uh, in the case of K-pop, that would be intimacy. So you have to look nice, cute, and intimate to these fans. And because of the frequent uh, interaction between these idols and Korean fans, uh, compared to inter non-Korean international fans, they have more interaction primarily with Korean female fans. And because of the amount of time and money that Korean fans invest in these idols, uh, Korean fans hold the greatest power and dominance over these idols. And thus, idols are obliged to respect fans as Koreans. So uh, Korean nationalism is not overtly uh, expressed um, in, in the fandom, but it's rather uh, expressed as you should respect me, and they maintain this identity as primarily as Korean, uh, Korean females. In other words, to dis disparage Koreans is to disparage his own fans. So I want to show you, uh, there's, a, there's a concept called fan service, uh, which is a, a uh, it can be expressed through musical or non-musical, uh, verbal, sometimes a physical contact or interaction between uh, idols and, and fans. And, Idols are basically um, providing pleasure uh, and amusement to these fans. So here, um, this is a video uh, took by uh, BTS fans at the fan sign event. So you um, you buy CDs and. Each CD serves as a lottery ticket to get into uh, these fan sign events. Um, so they buy CDs as many as 100 to 200 CD uh, copies. And then once they, once you you go to these fan sign events, you get autograph uh, from these idols. But you can also have conversation, one-on-one uh, -on -one conversation, for about. 30 seconds to as long as one minute. Um, so 
this is an example of how they have interaction and create intimate relationship between uh, idols and fans. And you'll see how they basically serve as a virtual uh, boyfriend. Um. So you you are meeting like these idols one by one and move to the next one. But then like uh, this guy here, he's uh, Jimin from BTS. He's not letting the girl go. But then like this girl would feel special um, because of this flirting. Um. So eventually what K-pop pursues is the, the fan dominant culture. Fans should feel uh, dominance over these idols and feel, uh, feel like they have power uh, to control and surveil and get respect from these idols. And one way of making this uh, hierarchy or, or the, the uh, dominant uh, position uh, to these fans is to, to make these idols look uh, like children. So they, they fan fantasize idols by infantilizing, infantilizing um, these idols. So this is a music video of BTS called Spring Day, and you see how they, the way they dress, uh, the way they behave, um, are they, they basically look like children. Um, they are, in reality, all of these are, uh, all of these boys are adults, but you feel like they are children whom you should protect, uh, protect. But in reality, you protect them, but at the same time, you feel like you have uh, power over these idols, so they um, they shouldn't have real uh, girlfriends in reality. They should openly uh, they should reveal all the private lives to their fans. Uh, otherwise, if you get caught with your real girlfriend, then uh, they they would take revenge on these idols. So I'll show you a snippet of Spring Day. So they pursue infantile image uh, in K-pop, whereas in Korean hip hop, um, historically Korean hip hop started out as a localized form uh, called rap dance music, which has now become K-pop or idol music today. Um, but it started out in the localized form called rap, uh, rap dance music, and then eventually these underground hip hop musicians and fans started to argue that um, this is not real music, this is not authentic, this is what, what, uh, this is not what I, uh, uh, what I would um, uh, consider as real uh, hip hop form musically. Uh, so eventually. They started to pursue uh, music authenticity by pursuing the, the, the American musical form of hip hop. So hip hop artists in Korea uh, put more emphasis in autonomy in the industry, uh, making their own music. In other words, they don't rely on fan service nor on the fan dominant culture. Um, I'll wrap it up with uh, 
Jay Park's、uh, recent music video, you see how he is、uh, counting on more on the 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 Asian Americanness in the music video,、um, and also aesthetics very often shown in American hip hop music、uh, music videos, like jewels, lots of jewels, and and、um, the fashion style of this woman is also.、Uh, Um, uh, based on the Korean、um, Asian Americanness, like or or American hip hop、uh, aesthetics, such as、uh, she has this kiss curls,、um, that is not popular at all in in Korean entertainment. And then this、um, culturally ambiguous、uh, outfits. It, it represents Asianness, but it's not sure whether it's from Korea. It's definitely not from Korea. It looks like、uh, Chinese, but you know, it's it's more、uh, ambiguous culturally.、Um, So,、uh, in K-pop, idols are the commodity commodity that fans consume, whereas in Korean hip hop, fans consume music. So there's no official fan clubs, no fan meets, no fan signs, nor uh, uh, fan service. Okay, thank you. All right, our our next speaker is UC Berkeley's own Frank Belay. Thanks, Cavalier, for organizing this event.、Um, so, it's, it's, I'm going to give you a little bit of a, um, a snapshot of a very dark corner of the Mongolian music landscape from a specific period, from the time I did my fieldwork in 2007 until the time I finalized my book around 2012. So that's so that's the the book that Charlotte kindly、uh, gave me a shout out for. Uh, and also, some of the some of the themes are taken again in this new book that's coming out in in June.、Um, so,、um, as I said, it's going to be kind of a very negative discourse,、uh, very violent.、Um, so, I I just want to warn people: if you feel like you don't want to look at that, that's fine. Please, I don't want to impose that on you. Um, so I'm going to be speaking about three different videos. I will start off with Durvan Zuk Budavar Khushanara, which was the the one video that I was told about when I was doing my field work and I was in investigating the Russian,、uh, the Mongolian Chinese、uh, interactions. And people were telling me, "Well, look at that video." So it was it was banned, but、um, even though it was banned, people knew it. People sang along. It was sang along that that、uh, that 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 music that、um, that song.、Uh, it was heard in public spaces, so it was kind of a, an interesting,、um, an interest. I think it was maybe one of the first anti-Chinese uh, songs, uh, definitely the first one I heard about, and it seems to be kind of led to other ones、uh, after that. So it doesn't mean the fact that it was played in in public spaces and that people engaged with it, it doesn't mean necessarily that everybody in Mongolia is anti-Chinese. Uh, but there is clearly、uh, there was a clearly a sufficient level of comfort to engage with it, to sing along, and to not make official complaints about this、um, this kind of、um, discourse. And the same thing about the anti-Chinese graffiti, graffiti that was found、uh, throughout the, the city. So there is a certain level of I mean this discursive violence is structural in many ways, and as I argue in in my book,、um, to be a real Mongol is to be anti-Chinese. It's kind of a, a definition of Mongolianness in in opposition to what China is or what China is imagined to be.、Um, so the the title of the song、um, kind of. Brings this idea of excess、uh, that is very central to these anti-Chinese sentiments in Mongolia. The idea of excessive desire that the Chinese have for money, for Mongolian women, and for the Mongolian land, and the idea that they they are rapacious and they want to take it back.、Um, the opening words of the song are in Chinese. And even though they are not linguistically accessible to most Mongols, they provide a really clear statement about what the Chinese are imagined to be about. 
The rest of the song, uh, so the, the rest of the lyrics is in Mongolian, describe the Chinese as poor, puny, worthless, with tiny bodies and bad breath. The song calls for the removal of Chinese from Mongolia by the most forceful means, by killing them all, down to the last one if possible. The video for the song, equally well known, reflects the lyrics with violent gestures mimicking shootings. So I'm going to show you a bit. So this is like, uh, just give you a few screen captures. And then the, 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 the Mongolian women who are very central to these narratives. <laughs> So by the time I was finishing my book, um, based on that research around 2012, there were quite a few more of these anti-Chinese songs. Uh, one of uh, maybe the most violent ones would be this one by G called Huja. So Huja is the, the, a very pejorative term to refer to the Chinese that you probably have, you might have heard in the song before as well that comes back. So this is basically, so it's, it is not very subtle about it, as you will see from uh, the kind of video imagery that it plays with. Um, uh, so the video really doesn't need much unpacking. It's very clearly, it's very clear what he's saying. The title is, you know, Huja, and this is the kind of imagery that he has. So I'm going to show you a little bit of this. So there's a, a lot of nationalist violence in these Mongolian videos, but of course the visuals of someone surrounded by animal carcasses, mouthing huja and weaving a meat cleaver is difficult to top. Uh, and I wish my, my colleague uh, Christian Soros was here because he's, uh, he's interviewed the rapper, so he would have a lot of things to say on the topic. So the third video um, excerpt I'm gonna show you is from, let's go back. Um, is from a band called L.A. Face in English, and the title is, again, very, very simply, Fuck Them Chinese. Uh, so the title as well as part of the lyrics, as you will see, are in English. So the video clip, I'm, I'm not going to, so I'm, I'm going to summarize a little bit what the video is about, because I'm just going to show you a little bit. So the video opens with a, a Mongol youth being taken into custody by the police. And the narrative then goes back and retraces the story for the viewer. So we see an, 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 anonymous, an, anonymous, an anonymous Chinese sniper shooting into a group of Mongols, killing one of them. Uh, 
As the camera closes up on the victim's face, the video cycles through images of his life, namely his happy wedding and his young, and his young widow giving birth. It then cuts to another scene and we see the victim's male friends confronting a group of Chinese men and shooting them point blank. Significantly, the video employs common imagery in its representation of the Chinese. They lack bravery, the snipers shoot at a distance and remains invisible to the camera, and they are depicted as scheming and secretive. The images in the videos also play on a number of rumors about what the Chinese are imagined to be like. These images are not easily decipherable for non-Mongolian audiences, but to a Mongolian viewer, they are immediately legible. So I'm just going to give you a few examples of what they are. So we, sh we see these storefronts in Mongolia with, with Chinese characters written on it. So in 2007, there was this big... Uh, big story in Mongolian newspapers, com people complaining there were so many Chinese characters everywhere and that pe we needed to do something about it, that the Chinese were actually trying to teach Mongols Chinese characters. So there was uh, groups of nationalists going around the city and, and tearing those signs down, but only the ones in Chinese, Korean or Japanese, anything Asian. If it was in English, no problem, it could just stay. Another, another image that we were shown is this seemingly banal, uh, banal image of Chinese man. So this is again plays another, on, another, on another rumor of uh, these groups of Chinese businessmen behind closed doors and trying to plot something about Mongolia. So that's the, the idea that keeps a story that keeps coming back. So by showing these images, they really plug into this, these narratives. But there's also the, the imagination of the Chinese are, uh, as physically unattractive, uh, as a coward, so as I said, you know, shooting at a distance, is not really confronting the, the Mongols and shooting them from far away. And, uh, and the video then concludes with images of Mongolian nature and it ends with the Mongolian flag. So it really kind of plays on those, um, those images. Okay. <laughs> So there's, there are basically two main points I want to I wanted to make. I'll try to make them in one minute. Um, that this discourse is overtly about the Chinese, but the real message conveyed is really one of masculinity, even hyper masculinity, and a discourse of masculinity under threat. Uh, traditional forms of Mongolian masculinity emphasize physical strength, resilience, capacity to drink. Uh, and these have been made redundant in, in many ways. Um, the traditional imaginations of, uh, imaginations of, of, um, of masculinity in Mongolia are idealized forms, of course, but this is difficult now for such idealizations because of the feminization of higher education and the workforce, and some men have felt kind of bypassed by this. Um, another, another thing we can see in this, this, um, this very very violent um, discourse, we actually see qu quite, I mean, not as much uh, actual violence as we might see, but when it does occur, it tends to be directed at Mongolian women who fraternize with the Chinese rather than the Chinese themselves. Um, and so hip hop for, for this kind of discourse has, has, proved, has proven to be a very apt vehicle, I think, for these gendered norms and hyper-masculinity and also racialized anger. So the second aspect I, I wanted to point out is this. Um, very often when I, when I spoke with people in Mongolia, they would see, they would explain these as kind of last ditch response to a small ethnic community under threat. Um, but I would argue that it's not really about these, these narratives are not really about being Mongolian, but m more about not being confused for a Chinese or an Asian person. The type of music, the gestures, the hairstyle, the dance moves, they have imp been imported piecemeal from the US. Um, note that the part of the song I just showed you LA, from LA Face, 
um, not to say anything about the title, is in English. And it mimics a certain form of gangster rap that is easily recognizable to US viewers. Um, similarly, anti-Chinese graffiti, I've, uh, I, I briefly mentioned at the beginning, can, are sometimes in Mongolian, but also can be in English. Um, so the argument I make in the book, uh, very briefly, is that these anti-Chinese violent discourse are partly directed at Mongols themselves, but also partly directed at a, a Western audience. The message is, we are not Asian, and look at us, we are like you, Western viewers. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Frank. Next up, we'll have uh, uh, Kendra Van uh, Nijhuis, uh from UC Berkeley. She'll be talking about national identity in uh, Korean underground rock and roll music. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, I'm going to jump right in because I've got a lot to cover. So. In experiencing and analyzing the underground rock scene that's both locally and globally focused, I've noticed that Korean bands often have different views emphasizing, on emphasizing their national or international identities. For some, distancing themselves from Koreanness is a way to position themselves as members of an international indie rock scene. Moreover, distancing oneself from Koreanness also works to separate bands from associations with K-pop. Korean rock bands often need to utilize the cultural capital at the, that global flows of K-pop provide while still differentiating themselves on an international market. With the undercurrent of authenticity baked into the concept of indie music, the manufactured nature of K-pop can be a detriment to Korean indie bands attempting to expand their reach abroad. One example of a band who's discussed this issue at length is Love X Stereo, specifically the lead singer Annie Ko. Annie is fluent in English, her songs are in English, and she often does promotional interviews in English for media both Korea-based and abroad. Levex Stereo has often toured in Europe and the US and played at the K-pop Night Out at South by Southwest Indie Festival in Texas multiple times. Annie admits the band would never have gotten the opportunity to play in the US without the influence of K-pop, especially the sudden and surprising popularity of Sai's Gangnam Style in the US. Koreanness can now get a band's foot in the door for international touring, but it can also keep the band from advancing in an authenticity-focused indie world. So I'll play a little bit of Love X Stereo. You can kind of hear what they sound like. So as you can hear, um, Ella Xerio has an electro rock sound, and because of this, international fans and media often mention the sonic similarities between Love X Stereo and K-pop acts. In an interview with a K-pop fan site before South by Southwest, Annie said, quote, consider our songs as an alternative or a substitute for K-pop. We create songs on our own, we do live performances all the time, and we always try to present ourselves as an international band like any other band throughout the world, end quote. You can see in this quote that Annie does not totally disavow the connections to K-pop, but instead pivots towards discussions of live performance, individual creativity, and international similarity to show the difference between a fake K-pop and the more authentic Love X Stereo. Annie even dislikes labels that echo the K-pop formulation, like K-Indie. When asked about K-Indie, she said, quote, We just want to be accepted as rock artists who happen to live in Korea, and that will do just fine but there must be some kind of process that needs to be done, I guess, end quote. I feel this quote best exemplifies the anxiety that many Korean bands feel in focusing on national identity. Being K-something helps gain attention, but can end up placing them within global circulation that they likely do not want to be in as rock musicians. Other rock groups use different musical formations of Koreanness to help sell their music abroad. One group that many of you may now be familiar with is the band Jambi Nai, who played at the closing ceremony for the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics. Jambi Nai is a metal band that uses traditional Korean instruments in their music. I'll play a little clip of that.
while one may assume that using traditional music is a way to appeal to a local audience, this is not the case for local Korean fan, rock fans. For me many young Koreans, traditional music can sound more foreign to them than classical rock, hip hop, or pop music that they grew up listening to. In fact, according to the lead songwriter of Jan Binai, Il Woo Lee, when Jan Binai first started playing in Korea, local fans treated them like a typical traditional group, clapping politely and listening intently like a traditional music concert. He said it wasn't until they started playing in Europe that they got the attitude and vibe of the metal music they were originally looking for from their audiences. The case of Jambi Nai shows that on an international indie market, having elements of local sonic identity in one's music can propel a rock band to new heights of popularity. Looking at the rhetoric of foreign media around Jambi Nai shows the emphasis and almost fetishization of traditional elements that the international community includes in their global rock discourse. For example, one album review praised the way Jambi Nai combines the foreign element of rock with the dramatic emotionalism of Korean traditional music and describe the instrument sounds in animalistic, naturalistic, and spiritual terms. Rolling Stone plays the metal group for, quote, harnessing the primordial groove of a folk instrument, end quote. And The Guardian praised the use of the ancient zither-like kamungo, stating their instrumental fusion style was thrilling, unexpected, and perfectly controlled, end quote. International media and um, academics about the local, politics of local and global sound often connect uh, bands' use of traditional instruments with an authentic style. And in Jambi Nai's case, it's connected to an authentic style of Korean rock, interpreting local sounds of traditional music as more Korean, despite the fact that Western popular music styles are actually more indicative of local musical tastes and listening habits of both Korean youth and the Korean rock bands of the scene. This formulation of Koreanness and rock can devalue bands that do not include traditional aspects of music in their work, which is the majority of the rock scene in Korea. So switching gears a bit to my own research um, and my work on re intercultural interaction, many of the bands that I work closely with in my fieldwork from 2016 to 2017 were a mix of Korean and foreign participants. By foreign participants in my research, I'm referring to non-Koreans, both ethnically and nationally. Typically, these were white, English-speaking males from Western countries, but I worked with foreigners of many different backgrounds. I also worked with many Korean diasporic returnees, like Korean Americans or Korean adoptees, whose experiences fell somewhere between what they described as the Korean and the foreign. As such, issues of national identity often played a role in my discussion with the bands. As a final example of nationalism in the Korean rock scene, I will compare the national identities of two bands, Tear Park and Table People. So Tear Park consists of Sehi, a Korean-Australian lead singer and guitarist, as well as three foreign male members, John and Nathan from the US and Laurent from Belgium. And I'll play a little bit of their music. Despite being numerically majority foreigners, Tear Park is often understood by fans to be more Korean than bands with foreign members. This is for a number of factors. First, the lead singer and the face of the band is ethnically Korean and sings in Korean. Second, her in-between song banter is in Korean, even though her English is fluent. Say he speaks in Korean even if the audience includes foreigners, saying that she wants to make sure that Tear Park's Korean fans are also comfortable at their shows. Finally, their social media promotion, like Facebook, is in Korean first and then in English. These are some of the th things that fans and friends pointed out as why they see this band as Korean. Fans and friends also argued that Tear Park has a more Korean sound to their music or feel to their performances, although most of my interviewees had trouble articulating what that meant to them outside of linguistic markers. I would argue that Tear Park fits with a certain style of shoegaze or psychedelic female-led rock that's popular with other Korean bands like Dabda, Gutenberg, and a number of others, which makes it easier to associate them with that clique of performing Korean rock musicians. So while the lineup of table people has changed a few times, for the majority of time I knew them, they had a reverse national makeup to Tear Park. The lead singer and guitarist was Eric, a white man from the US, 
And the band included Korean American Ethan and Koreans Myung and Soyoung. So I'll play a little bit of Table People. And that's a, a live performance, but the vocals sound like that on the album as well, pretty much. <laughs> um, so, Table People was described almost exclusively as a foreigner band, and friends cited the foreign lead singer and the fact that the song's promotion and banter was in English for the main reasons. I would also argue, however, that Table People's sound and style fit into what I like to call white bro rock, with sliding and slightly out of tune vocals, a beachy, repetitive guitar line, and a general laid back or sloppy feeling that's associated with a lot of other all white, all male foreigner bands that perform in Korea, like used cassettes, rough cuts, and a number of others. Interestingly, both the members of Tier Park and Table People tend to refer to their bands without nationality, saying that they are soul based or they were formed in South Korea in interviews and in promotional materials for festival performances. However, members of both bands also expressed frustration with their lack of national status, saying that they were not Korean enough for national support that other Korea-based indie bands can receive from the government, but not foreign enough to be seen as an asset that could connect other musicians to performance circuits abroad. Some members strongly felt that if a foreign musician wanted to make a living out of making music, the best thing that they could do was leave Korea. Um, so in this paper, I've tried to buzz through a few of the issues of national identity that I've found in the Korean indie rock scene. Um, and I look forward to hearing our final panelist and the productive discussion that I'm sure is likely to follow. So thank you. Uh, our, our last speaker is from uh, San Jose State, uh, Marissa Smith, and she'll be talking about uh, uh, under One Sky, Under One Han, uh, who leads the construction of trans-border Mongolian political identity in a collaboratively produced Mongolian, Inner Mongolian, Buryat hip hop video. Uh, let's welcome her. Yeah, so this is basically, this is a, a hip hop uh, video, a song, a collaboration between, um, I think it's like around 10 different artists from Mongolia, Inner Mongolia, um, Baryatya in the Russian Federation, and um, Tuva. Um, and it just came out uh, last month, um, and it has this, again, very elaborately produced music video. Um, I, I want to talk about specifically how the image of, of Chinggis Khan, or Genghis Khan as he's more well known perhaps to some of us, um, how his image um, reinforces this uh, sort of like, yes, we're all Mongols, but all roads lead back to Mongolia. And this is a very strong um, uh, a uh, lead motif here. Um, and an additional point, one reason I'm interested in this, this image of Chinggis Khan, um, a, a point I wanted to make that I think is not uh, perhaps made too much when we're speaking about hip hop or pop music, but that, that I think you know, was definitely uh, something that was being you know, implied in a lot of the presentations today, is that you know, we need to take these people as you know, serious political actors. Um, you know, it's not just that these people are you know, being uh, totally managed by the state um, or things like that. You know, they are very serious um, uh, cultural producers, is maybe the word I would use here. Um, and this, this um, just to get right into it, this um, video does this in a very interesting way. So, um, incidentally, uh, the, the video is tied together by a song from this 1970s um, uh, state socialist backed, party backed group, uh, Soil Erden, which um, Peter was just talking about. They have a song called, um, uh, basically, it translates into English as a camel caravan. And it's this very interesting, kind of self orientalizing sort of song. Um, it kind of has a similar uh, melody even to the song Peter played. So it's, it's psychedelic, but it's also recognizably Mongolian, but maybe downplaying that a bit. So anyway, we see these, this image of these caravaneers, um, and they're carrying. Uh, uh, the parts of a yurt or a ger, 
And actually, the song is called Tonot, which means under the roof of one gear. So one of the images that's going on here is a kind of wandering around, you know, different uh, parts of the, the, the Mongol world um, outside the bottom boundaries of Mongolia and erecting a, a gear for all of them to come under. So that's another thing here. And it's interesting, again, that this Soyold Erden is played because, you know, this is, I think, a way of them saying, like, look, we are, you know, cultural producers doing a political thing. Um, and this is this is part of a kind of larger argument I'm developing about the image the use of the image of Chinggis Khan that is also saying like look I'm doing something that the Mongolian state is doing I'm doing a political thing. So, um, so one of the first artists that actually comes on is uh, an artist um, from a group called um, Poor Man Beggar, which you know that's a pretty political name to have, right? He's Inter-Mongolian. Um, and if you look at a lot of his other pieces, he's, you know, on the grassland um, and he's explaining, um, you know, in Mongolian, my name means I'm poor, implying that he's poor because of his minority status. Um, in this song, uh, his lyrics are very, um, actually not really political at all, but he's representing this, this um, character of Mongolianness tied to musical culture and to the, the structures of the landscape. Um, but he also refers to Chinggis as, as a deity, both Chinggis. Um, and he says that that's what actually ties Mongolians together, is ultimately knowing the path of Chinggis. Um, and this is the mausoleum of Chinggis Khan in, in Ordos. So it is actually in Inner Mongolia. But right before this image in the video, um, we're reminded that there's an even bigger um, uh, uh, monument of Chinggis Khan than this one, uh, which is the near Ulaanbaatar, it's actually the tallest equestrian statue in the world. So right before they show this one in Inner Mongolia, they uh, show an even larger one in, in Mongolia to remind us again, you know, this is where Mongolia really is, right? Um, after that, we go to Russia, the Russian Federation. Um, and there is a Buryat um, rapper named, um, I think he usually goes in his own videos as Ali Zhe, which is also interesting because he's kind of self-orientalizing a bit. Um, but he's not actually credited with the same name, I don't think, at the end of this video. But he actually, um, uh, wh whereas Poor Man Beggar, he, he's using a very understandable um, Mongolian. It, it sounds, you know, very halk. It's poetic, but it's not archaic. Um, um, Ali Dze is rapping in Buryat, and it's very obviously Buryat, but it's also, it is recognizable. You can understand it if you speak sort of standard halk Mongolian. Um, and his lyrics are really interesting, too, because they're basically saying, um, oh, we have this new path open to us. Um, it's a new era. Let's look. It's, it's, it's also kind of, there, there's some open to, to it, but, openness to it, but it's, it's about kind of the future. It's very future-oriented. Um, and this is actually in Kalmykia, which is a western, far west. Uh, it's in western Russia, actually. I won't uh, explain why that is, because I don't have time. Um, so we go kind of to like one of the furthest extremes. We go west of the Urals, and we're brought back immediately on the wings of this falcon to Mongolia. Um, and this is sort of north central Mongolia, which is associated with Chinggis Khan. Um, this, this guy has some very interesting lyrics, very skilled. Um, and he, he says some things about, um, there's nothing really explicitly lyrics wise from what I can pick up at least that's as explicitly, um, you know, sinophobic or xenophobic as what Franck was pointing out. Um, but um, not that, that that's not kind of put there for people to recognize. Uh, but he says some things like um, there, uh, people see development and become jealous. Um, we are, um, we need to remember the strength of our union, um, things like this. And he does actually make some references to like the blue spot, the people with the blue spot, and so some sorts of biologized uh, markers of Mongolist and so on and so forth. Um, then we, we go to these fellows. Um, these guys are members of Ice Top. Um, so again, you know, we often like to, to speak in sort of hip hop studies or whatever about it being a youth culture. Of course, not everyone is all that young anymore, right? <laughs> um, these guys are kind of elder statesmen of Mongolian hip hop. Um, and of course, they're in this, you know, um, fur bedecked palatial gear um, with, an, with a, a portrait of Chinggis Khan. And then behind, there's also some of the other Khans. Um, and they actually flat out list the various Mongols, you know. Um, 
they 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 just give you a list of about ten different groups of people. Tuvens Urat Zakchin Halk Buryat in Uver Mongol Halmuk Tuvens Hazara Dead Mongol, and then they say you know these people are all part of the United Mongol, and then they even say they are united and they are as if they are one person. Nektekhun. So this is really strong, and then they they um, say they're not under the fist of anyone, and it's also very kind of physical the way that they're they're acting here. Um, I you will recognize this fellow from Frank's presentation. I hopefully don't have to go into that, but we get some very militaristic imagery. Um, and I would also just like to note that that he has been you know really really rising in popularity. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if he tries to run for parliament sometime soon. So also to kind of say, when I say these people are political actors, like I, I do mean that. And we need to, I think, pay attention to that. Um, so finally, this is another member of ISTOP. And he, um, again, this is a reference to Chinggis Khan that doesn't necessarily show to, to non-Mongolians. Um, so this is, this is a cairn that's in, um, this is, this is one of the mountains, Borkhan Haldun. This is one of the sites that's associated with where Chinggis Khan actually was given, um, you know, he actually propitiated heaven and these mountains to have the power to become Chinggis Khan, to unite the Mongols. Um, and this is also represented by these, these black banners, um, which again are very much a sign of the Mongolian state and displaying yourself with these is not something that you, you do lightly. Um, and his, uh, his style is very interesting. And what he just says to kind of sum everything up is he makes this sort of chant. And he basically says, you know, by the tens, by the thousands, by the 10,000, by the millions, by the billions, all the Mongols will assemble. OK. Um, and that's basically my talk. Um, I just wanted to finish with this slide to sort of show you that, you know, this is the kind of imagery that the Mongolian state also uses. So this is the um, inauguration of President Elbig Dorge in 2013. This is him taking the oath of inauguration at the massive, another massive monument to Chinggis Khan, which is in the center of, of Ulaanbaatar. Um, so uh, again, here uh, what these what these artists are doing in this song is they are you know stating a a sort of uh, an inner Mongol or uh, a sort of pan Mongolian international order, which um, I think as Charlotte's presentation also showed. Um, is to some degree recognized by by uh, Mongolians beyond the borders of Mongolia, but you know it's uneasy. But it is to some degree recognized by them as well, um, and this is this is being done in, in a way that is certainly um, you know in in resonance with what state actors are doing. And I don't mean necessarily in a way that the state is kind of managing it. It's more mixed up than that. Um, okay, I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. Can we can have all the speakers come up, uh, and, and we'll have a, a few minutes of discussion. We can have 15, 20 minutes or so. Thank you. Uh, so I'm uh, neither a music specialist uh, nor someone who works in either Mongolia or Korea. So this is going to be coming from a space of great ignorance. Um, but the thing that I kept thinking about as, you, as I was watching and listening to all the papers was the figure of the nation. Um, and each of you in some way tried to either locate or grapple with uh, the nation in these forms of music. And uh, I was thinking about how, um, for instance, in American pop music, right, we never say A-pop or hip-hop, right? It's the, the, the default. Um, but there, there have been sort of trends that we could see where we see the nation as an object also emerging in American hip-hop or pop music. Um, like every uh, R&B singer from Beyonce to Ciara all did like a torture porn warehouse music video following 9-11. Um, right, like this is something that's really clearly expressing not just a trend in music industries, but also um, like a national event um, and sort of visualizing it all at the same time. Um, and I was wondering beyond these sort of traditional markers that uh, not all of you, but some of you have noted as flagging the nation, whether there are these sort of 
um, event-based narratives that emerge or, you know, sort of like current or timely images that sort of appear uh, in these forms. Thank you. Can I answer to that? Um, there's a K-pop group called BTS, and they won the Top Social Artists Award at um, American Music Awards. Um, it was based on the the votes um, that they earned online, uh, solely by fans, and they they um, won over Justin Bieber, who got the award uh, during the last uh, six years. And then uh, BTS started to get lots of opportunities uh, to do interviews with American mass media. And one of the questions they got the most was, do you have any plans to uh, release, uh, release an album in English? And fans started to make lots of memes and uh, video clips just satirizing like how the American mass media wanted to uh, make them release English uh, albums. And then there was uh, one radio interview um, with an American fan who asked uh, BTS whether they have any plans to sing in English. And then um, the leader of BTS were um, just satirizing by saying like, okay, thank you for your advice. Like you should definitely come to our company and you know, work for us. Um, and then it, it actually got lots of support from uh, non-Korean international fans. Um, so that's how I found out that like, this is how they develop this kind of uh, Koreanness or, or emphasis on Korean identity, uh, not just starting from the industry, but it is also shaped by these uh, international fans. Anything else? Any, any of those? Can I, yeah, I, 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 I can, um, I'm not quite sure how, how what I have to say connects with what Stephanie you're, uh, you're, you're saying about this. As far as the, the, the timeliness of these these ide ideas of nation, um, it's striking to me how up until about 2006, 2007, we didn't see these things in pop music in Mongolia. It wasn't the interest of there. And to, and, but it's, it's the thing now. I mean, it's like the thing now. When you, when you see this and the things that, that Frank is talking about, um, the, the very negative kinds of portrayals of nation in, in contrast to the Mongols. Um, but then the, the kinds of stuff that, um, that Bolt is doing, I was talking about very sunny kind of nationalism, but I think I think it's kind of pushed by some of the same forces at work there of something is going on in Mongolian society that, that's making people think very, very deeply about the nation and want to express the nation, want to express patriotism, uh, not unlike, you know, the kind of patriotism we, we, we see going on in, America, in our, own, our own country in, the, in, the, in the, recent, the recent years, this resurgence of kind of like whatever it is, kind of a frustration or something that, that makes you want to embrace America or, or you have the, the negative side of it and the, the, you know, the white nationalist and the rise of the alt-right and such, and then you have the other extreme. But all this is, is fairly new and it's fairly new in Mongolia too. So I think you know, in terms of expressing the nation, it's fairly recent and I think it's kind of coming from some deep turmoil in Mongolian society as a whole, these kinds of things. Um, but it's interesting in Korea, it's, it's kind of a different, a different kind of thing, different forces that work there in this. Mm -hmm. so, following that, um, so in Mongolia, any of the Mongolian specialists um, can answer. I just wonder, um, as they're progressively um, kind of borrowing this, you know, Western ideas and, um, you know, images, is there any female artist in the industry right now? Because <laughs> um, you talk about all this masculinizing, you know, the, uh, trying to present this strong nation but, and leaving the Asia, but at the same time, they are going very progressive and, um, you know, 
we try to associate them with uh, the West. Mm -hmm. So I wonder um, if there are any voice from uh, female artists mm -hmm. on the scene. Yeah, Mar Marissa, do you, do you want to say something? Yeah, um, so the video I was just talking about actually has some interesting, um, there's two female artists who follow the, the um, gay and the, the sort of border guard act. And one of them makes a comment about um, basically saying, it's actually quite militaristic too. There's sort of this like uchai, which is supposed to be kind of what, how Mongolian soldiers would hail each other to all the Mongolian women. And then there's, a, there's one line that says like, the, the courage of the man is the wisdom of the queen or something. And, but it, it is very much what Frank has described in his work of like women sort of telling other women this is how women should support like Mongolian the Mongolian nation. So there is it's kind of a self disciplining kind of discourse I would say. Um, and it's interesting in that video because there are only two female artists and they kind of go back to back. Um, the other person who's working on this in the Mongolian context is Montahai Buyendelger, and they're, they're, the, both of these women are also very modern modernly dressed. They're wearing like suits. And they're not wearing traditional traditional clothing. One of them is in Ulaanbaatar, so there's this kind of um, specific femininity being disciplined, I would say, in these in these pop musical forms and hip hop forms. Yeah. I could I, I could add too. In, in the the video we saw that that Kevin showed us at the very beginning here, the, the little clip that that uh, trailer, um, we saw that the rapper Genie who is the, the first Mongolian rapper, and to this point, the only Mongolian rapper, but she, she's encouraging other women to do this. She struggles with this concept of how am I gonna portray myself as, as just a man with male figures, or am I gonna, do I have something uniquely fe, fe, feminine or, or from a, a, a woman's perspective? And she, she tries with that, but I mean, she, she's kind of like a lone voice in this field of men yeah. and doing the these kinds the, of things. The names of the two artists in the video, it's Mrs. M, which I'm assuming is a reference to Mongolia, and I think the the other person is named Real Label, like, so there's, yeah, this kind of like authenticity thing just in their names, yeah. I was really struck by Ste uh, Stephanie, your, your talk, right next to uh, Frank's talk, um, because Frank was, was you know, deeply masculine and, and uh, nationalistic in that sense, and, and yet what you're, some of the images you're per portraying are, uh, men being portrayed almost as young boys or androgynous or women or something of this nature. And uh, I don't, in all of your talks on, on K-pop, I didn't see a real strong, or I don't know, let me throw this out there, kind of like how are men or boys being portrayed in this, or men portrayed? Is, is there a similar kind of masculinity at work in K-pop? I didn't see it, but is it out there? Is it, is it what, what you guys have encountered? Um, yeah, um, I think they're trying to uh, portray submissive masculinity in the, the female dominant uh, fandom. Um, the, so K-pop started out in the late uh, 1990s and, uh, when, when H.O.T. debuted, it was the, the group was produced by this uh, one producer, um, and then they were going through all the training system, and then later on, this training uh, process was systemized uh, by what we now call it as K-pop, but then like the term K-pop is you know, uh, named by outsiders. So like in Korea, it is called idol music. Um, and by then, these uh, female fans were teenagers, and then later on, they they these um, so the 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 generation of HOT is called first generation, and nowadays, like BTS or EXO, are called third generation idols. Uh, meanwhile, the 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 female teenagers who were fans of the first generation got older, and they're still uh, participating in these fan activities for third generation idols. And you see the, the, the age gap between them. So these uh, female fans who 
have enough time and money to invest in these uh, idols are in their late 20s and even early 30s. Um, they have enough money. They don't have to get permission from their parents to go to all these concerts and fan, meet, fan meets. Um, and then they, when, they, when they meet these idols, these idols are trying to uh, 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 be polite and, and respect these uh, fans as Nuna, which means older sister. Um, so you see how the, the ageism, Korean ageism works, uh, is at work uh, between the, the relationship between idols and fans. Um, so these days, one of the ways they, they, they uh, consume K-pop is to have this virtual relationship. One is to treat them as, as uh, virtual boyfriends, but the other is to treat them as, uh, as virtual children. Um, although these, these uh, fans are not married, the majority are not married, but they treat them as, they, they call them as my child or my boy. Um, so you see how these images are, you know, to outsiders, it might look like uh, uh, androgynous. I would say they are trying to portray um, adolescent masculinity. So they, they very often shave their legs. Uh, they don't show, they don't grow a beard or anything, um, or they, they would... Uh, wear uh, sweaters with long sleeves as if, you know, like mothers often uh, make their kids wear, you know, bigger clothes because they grow up. Um, also, they, with their facial expression, like they try to look very extremely naive. Um, so to me, it looks like rather than being androgynous, it looks like they're trying to pursue adolescent uh, masculinity, uh, which works very well with the, the older female fans and uh, younger boy groups. Adding to uh, Stephanie's comment, uh, within the K-pop, there are this uh, specific aesthetics and formulaic characteristics. And as noted by some other um, scholars, the kind of masculinity or uh, gender aesthetics within the K-pop, especially when it comes to boy band, is known as like soft masculinity or Asian masculinity. So um, to accommodate uh, Asian fans, the kind of masculinity that, uh, as we know of Americans, are uh, way too strong. So it has to be softened. Uh, so it is the masculine, um, not from those examples that we saw, but uh, some other more dance, heavy dance-oriented uh, music videos are uh, quite masculine. Um, but at the same time, they need to uh, project this soft side of um, being, a, being an accessible man. Um, so I would say the kind of masculinity uh, we don't see in K-pop is because that uh, genre itself is going for very specific uh, aesthetics and uh, gender ideas. Yeah, and I think that, you know, pop itself is kind of, is already feminized, right? So, I mean, if you're looking at Korean rock or if you're looking at Korean hip hop um, or indie rock, you're, you're going to find more, I think, more examples of, you know, uh, hyper masculinity or, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, I realized that after my presentation together that I had majority female, mem you know, bands with female members and actually in the scene that's not representative at all of what's going on. It's majority men. Um, and it falls very much along, the masculinity performance falls along gender, uh, not gender, genre lines. Um, so like for punk music, it's very aggressive, very violent, you know, forward kind of presentation, whereas like shoegaze or post-rock is the more subdued, quiet. Um, so the way that men are performing masculinity is very closely tied to what genres they associate with and the sounds that they're performing, so. Oh. Um, it's really hard to go across the papers. They're so different. Um, and so just one of the things I wanted to cite was, um, it was had to do with gender, but also um, that these genre, as you're speaking of them, like hip hop and, whether you call it gay pop or idol pop, I come out of Japanese performance studies. So, I mean, they're just really fraught, right? So each one of your papers has such particularities to it. 
But that said, what I was realizing is that YouTube <laughs> is a medium that goes across. And I know, like in China and some other places, it's hard to get. But maybe from Thomas Lamar's work in animation, I'm really interested in how the media mediatizes your theorization of these forms. So, you know, as we were, you were bringing them up, we have the landscape, we have the animal, we have, but then you have the angle of the camera, down or up or dark. And whether you've considered, is, is YouTube, in a sense, that popular space, <laughs> um, digital space, also, how is that part of your different um, performances? Yeah, because I, I guess I was really thinking of Frank Franks, and and then we go to the K-pop idols, and how it's not just the softness of their bodies or their other kind of masculinity, but it's how the media is visible, making them visible. Yeah. I think those are really interesting points. I, I think just because we have, I'm afraid we have a, a technical issues, so I'm afraid as stimulating as the discussion is, we have to uh, take a break here. Um, I want to thank all our panelists, many of some of whom have come from quite far away. Uh, so um, thank you all for coming, and we really appreciate it, and look forward to the webcast soon. Thank you all.